Hello, John Talley here with Partzilla.com, and welcome to another live edition from our Friday event at 3 o'clock. Um, before we even get in to start answering any questions, uh, I just want to start with saying that uh, everybody that's affected by Hurricane La uh, Laura and all the devastation that it has called, my thoughts and prayers are with you. And, I hope that you can, uh, if you have been affected by this, um, that you recover quickly and rebuild just as quick as you can. Um, we've been through something similar here in Albany, although not nearly as devastating as the pictures I've seen. So uh, my heart definitely goes out to you. With that being said, we are going to spend a few minutes answering a few questions. I'm going to let them stack up in the queue, and then I'll start working my way through them. And before we know it, 30 minutes will have passed, and then I can uh, go on to my weekend. Okay, Jason is asking me, hey John, should I put a fuel tuner on my 2015 700 Grizzly? It is not driven much at all. I use it mainly for deer hunting, and it has 109 miles on it today. I would say no. I mean, the main reason you want to have a fuel tuner is to tell the machine what aftermarket equipment you may uh, have attached to it, whether that be a different air filter or a different exhaust system or a different muffler. And that, at that point, you need to kind of negotiate with the ECU so it'll send the correct air fuel mixture. Now, if you haven't changed anything on the machine as far as the intake or the exhaust or the cam goes, then there's really no reason to tell it to, to alter those fuel tables. So I would say leave it alone unless you decide to modify, you know, either the intake, the exhaust, and or maybe a, a camshaft replacement. So, nope, I would leave it alone because Yamaha knows what they're doing. I, I'd, let, I'd let them run the show on that one. All right, what else do we have today? All right, Gavin Cook just threw one out there. I have a 2005 400EX, one of my favorite machines, and I'm constantly putting oil in it. That's not a good sign. It doesn't leak, and it only smokes a little bit when revved super high. Any ideas? Well, a couple of uh, questions for you first. Have you done a compression test on it yet? Uh, I'd like to know what the numbers are in there. And typically, when you're saying that it, it burns the uh, burns the oil when you've really given it a lot of uh, a lot of juice, that typically indicates that you're going to have a problem with your valves. Maybe the seals are worn. Maybe the the guides are a little bit worn. It's letting oil seep past into the combustion chamber. But without without knowing the numbers first. I'd be afraid to point you one direction or another. So if you would pick up a uh, compression tester, do a test, and then let me know. Uh, if the compression test is inconclusive before you go pulling it apart, if we really think it's losing it somewhere, either the head or the, uh, the piston rings itself, you may want to consider doing a leak down test. Now, I'm not sure if we did a leak down test on that particular model, but I, I'm fairly certain that we did a, a compression test. And if you would, go to the, pl the playlist for our 400EX and I can walk you through the process to do that. Give me a mo little bit more information, send it to us either during the week or uh, come in next Friday and tell me what you find and see if we can uh, help figure this out for you. All right, I'm not even gonna try to uh, pronounce that name. Hi John, what color co coolant do I use for my MT-10? Uh, the same as used for the Grizzly. Thanks. I believe so, but depending on the color isn't as important as the mixture of, of the uh, actual antifreeze or coolant, as you say. You just want to make sure that it's completely compatible with aluminum, both aluminum heads and, and the cylinders as well as the radiator itself because I've seen a lot of people they'll just pick up whatever um, coolant that they may find at a local parts store and dump it in there and that's not what you want to do that that will um, it would more or less attack all the aluminum in your engine and on any Japanese machine primarily it's going to be aluminum so you might want to make sure that it, it plays nice with that type of metal. But to answer your question, could it be the same you use for the Grizzly? I don't see any reason why you couldn't do that. So you go right ahead. All right, and they showed you how to do a compression test. Hmm. Rolka is asking me, hi, when dirt bike is very hot, it shuts down, but it starts easily and dies again. 
possible it's crankshaft bearing? I doubt it. Um, if you're telling me it just shuts off, that seems to indicate probably an electrical or a fuel issue. If the crankshaft were actually getting hot and binding it up to the point it stopped it from rotating, you would not be able to kick it over that easily uh, so quickly, uh, and probably not at all once met you get metal on metal contact where it's not supposed to be, and uh, it's, it just doesn't cool down and become easier to deal with. My gut tells me to take a peek at your, your coil on this one, because I've seen so many times, once a coil gets heated up, it starts to break down, and then it's unable to send the spark. Once it cools back down, that gap opens up in the windings, and then it's able to, to uh, produce the spark again for a short period of time until, of course, it collapses. So take a look at your coil first, and then see where that takes you. All right. What else do we have here? Check a different board over here. Julio is asking me, I have a 2005 TRX 250EX. I'm getting good fuel flow. It has spark and compression. It cranks up but won't start. Hmm. That, that seems to be a, a paradigm there. So I cleaned the carburetor and put a whole new cylinder head and piston and it still won't turn over. I need help. All right, are you telling me that it won't turn over at all or it spins over and just doesn't want to start? Okay, well, let's go with the first scenario. It won't turn over at all. Well, that's where we need to look at the starting system itself. And I believe on the 400EX, which is similar to yours, it's going to have the same components. Let's go through, check the starter solenoid, check your start switch, make sure that that run switch is actually where it's supposed to be because... Believe it or not, I've seen machines come into the shop. Oh, it won't start. All we have to do is click it over in the run, then it'll fire right up. Always try to figure out the simplest thing first. But if it's not that switch, take a look at your starter solenoid. Make sure it's functioning. You should be able to hear it click. If it doesn't click, then check the fuse for it. And if both of those are still operating, get out a test light. Make sure that it's actually transferring power from one side to the other, because I've actually heard the starter solenoids click but the contact was actually burned on the inside, which you could not see, and that would not allow voltage and current to pass through it. If all of that is operating correctly, and you're telling me that it does turn over and it just does not want to fire, then you want to take a look at your spark to make sure it's actually sparking. Beyond that, you may need to check, is the spark strong enough? And they make a couple of different testers where you're actually looking for a certain amount of gap for it to jump. I believe Motion Probe makes a, a, a nice unit for that. So if you would check our site, if you have to go that far into it. Other than that, you're gonna have to give me a little bit more information. Um, let me know if any of those were the, uh, the issue. If not, do a little bit more footwork. Give me some more in input as far as what it's doing or not doing, and we'll get this thing figured out for you. Hey, Gareth. Good to see you again as well. <laughs> Everything's going, uh, going good in, in my world, no doubt. All right, William's asking me, hey, John, I want to put a light bar on my Yamaha Raptor 250, but don't want to put it directly to the battery because it would run that battery down. Any ideas? Thanks. Yes, there is a certain way you need to go about this because the Yamaha Raptor 250 is more or less well, a sportish type machine and it does not have the capabilities to uh, add on a light for that particular circuit for the headlight. So what you want to do is add in a relay. So what you would do is if you want it to come on every single time that your light does, what you can do is go into the relay and have that be its trigger. But what you're relaying is the power from the battery going to the LED bar itself. Is the, the, it would be the correct way that you'd want to do it. That way, of course, when you shut off the key or turn off your light, both of them go down. If you want it to operate independently of the, the headlight switch, then you actually need to add in, a, add in a switch for that as well. Now, on that particular make and model, you're not going to have a, a really easy place to put it and it needs to be a smaller switch you know, because let's face it that is a sport type machine and it's not like a Polaris where they have a whole panel waiting for 
whatever type of accessory switches you need to add in. So I would head for a smaller, uh, smaller switch, just make sure that it has the amperage capabilities of whatever your light bar is that you're using. And also make sure you do that for your relay as well. And most importantly, if you're going directly to the battery, I need to point out that it needs to go from the battery, through a fuse, through your relay, and then out to your light. And of course you're using your switch just to trigger that relay. Got it? If not, drop a note and I will answer back and draw you a picture if we need to, or a schematic as it is. Let's see what else we've got here today. All right, DLAC has a 2016 Brute Force 750. It sputters from zero to a quarter throttle, runs great at wide open throttle, and can be hard to start when cold outside and sometimes rough idle. Well, I think what you're describing there is symptom, symptomatic of actually a, a valve adjustment. Because when the valves, when the faces start to wear down, well, guess what? They start to get further up into the head, and that gives it less clearance up, up at, the, uh, at, the, uh, at the camshaft itself. So they're not really closing all the way. And when they don't close all the way, it makes them harder to start, especially when they're cold. When they warm up, that, it starts to run a little bit better. So I would go in and make sure that your valves are not too tight. Once again, go in there, take a look, and if I'm right, drop us a note, then we can pass that information on as being good. All right, you already did plugs, fuel pump, and air filter, okay? Go back and look at those valves. Now, I, after you just told me that you already checked or changed those three things, I think it's the valves even more because that's three things that it's not. <clears throat> All right, NIV is asking me, hi John, I'm going to change the sprocket on my GSXR600, one, minus one plus two, do I need to add a, a speedo healer? That's gonna throw it off. Um, I, can't, I doubt I can do the math in my head quick enough, but about three miles an hour. So either you need to keep up with that or the police will. So if you want to have your bike be predictable and accurate, Go ahead and uh, put the adjuster on there to where the speedometer will read correctly. All right, Lucas is asking me, John, is it worth it to switch to power sports? I'm a licensed auto tech, but had a U-Haul door fall on my head, and now I have a brain injury. Well, <laughs> That's, that's pretty good. Well, it may qualify you for being a, a, a power sports tech. I mean, I managed to do it, so it can't be that tough. So I'd say, come aboard. Let's see what you got. <laughs> oh, I love people like that. What else do we have here today, guys? Rodriguez, 350Z, is asking me, hello there, I have a question. My CBR, I'm still laughing about the other question. My CBR 600 RR 2008 has a temperature issue. It goes up and down like crazy. Um, 90 to 150, 90 to 210, 0 to 95. And I replaced the radiator cool, coolant and temperature sensor, but I, it's still the same. Are we sure about those temperatures? With that kind of bouncing around, I'm beginning to wonder if, if the sensor itself, oh, you did replace the temperature sensor. Is, well, then I'm wondering about the gauge. Is there a way for you to get a, uh, another cluster to take a look? Because that is some serious jumping around. Now, had you not already done uh, replacement with the radiator, a coolant and everything, I would have guessed you had error in the system somewhere and that still might be the case. Did you go through the, the correct procedure to go ahead and bleed it correctly? Because I've seen air pockets calls which you're talking about and if that's not the issue, it's not an air pocket and it's not the, uh, the actual um, the, gauge, the gauge cluster itself, then I would want to take a look at the water pump to make sure there's not a couple of different veins maybe broken on it or possible it's actually spinning on the end of the shaft and not actually turning the veins like it should. So I'll tell you what, after thinking it through, why don't we go take a look at that water pump vein first and then work our way. If that's okay, then we can go back and address those other issues that I suggested that you look at. Frank, I'm not sure what you're asking me. 
Oh, you're asking me to decide if I like the Renegade or the Grizzly? I'm not going to say. We're not going to start that kind of war out here. <laughs> I like them both. How's that for a cop-out? I should be a politician. Lucas, um, if, if you're serious about it, and I mean, think about what you're asking me here, because either working with a car or the uh, the power sports industry, although the machines are a little bit lighter, you're you're still in a pretty hostile environment. Uh, environment, and if you truly do have an injury, you may want to consider putting the tools down because um, it, these things can hurt us. I mean, they can if we're not careful. I would suggest if you want to stay in the industry uh, to look into the uh, a service rider position and or service manager and uh, to utilize your knowledge that way and not put yourself in physical harm because um, that, that, uh, that could be detrimental to you and to everybody around you on a serious note. All right, what else do we have? d like is saying he didn't suspect the valves that it only has a 30, 130 hours on it. That's enough to go check, no doubt. Did it ever go in for its first service? Because that is one of the first things uh, that you do after the break-in procedure and the 100-hour service. On just about every Yamaha, you're supposed to go in and check those valves because uh, chances are they've tightened up now. So that makes me think that that's going to be the answer even more so. Go take a peek, then let me know. I think we already answered that one. All right, K, long name. I did an oil change on my 07 400 EX today, and when reinstalling the oil filter cover, the long bolt would not tighten up and then snapped. Oh boy. I thought I was, I was using a 3H uh, torque wrench set to seven foot pounds since I just bought the bike and wanted to be certain. Any ideas what I should do? Why the bolt kept spinning? Why did the bolt kept spinning and bat and snap? Thanks for the videos. Oh boy, I, I hate hearing that. First question I want to have answered is what torque wrench was it? I mean, I've I've had one lie to me before. Not so much lie to me is the one that I use. I mean, it's a high quality one, but if you let it sit for too long it'll shut off and it'll give you no indication that that has happened <laughs> until you start raking, ranking down and torquing it in and you and your internal torque wrench is saying stop, 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 but it's just not beeping. So I'd be curious, did, the, did it turn off by, by chance? But to answer your question, now what do you do? And that long bolt, I'm trying to remember how far into the engine you're gonna have to go because to correct this, I'm not a big fan, a big fan of uh, helicals. The, what I do like using are time certs, and I'm afraid that's where you're going to have to get to. You're going to have to get down to wherever those threads are, drill it out, and then get a time cert in there. Whew. I, I hate that that happened, buddy. Um, let me go back and look at exactly where those threads are and see if what I'm what I'm telling you is going to work or if you're going to have to get a little bit more intensive and actually have to do a case replacement. Uh, I really hope that's not the, not the case and I'm not being punny about that at all. But let me take a peek at the uh, our exploded diagrams and um, see if a time sort will work for you. Wow, I'm not touching that with a 10-foot pole. Um, <laughs> Jason is asking me, uh, my 04 Recon idles rough and shuts off. Could this be a carb problem? Chances are it is going to be a carb problem. It sounds like your, your idle jet is uh, partially stopped up, if not all the way. So you need to open it up, take a peek. But before you do that, go to your, your idle adjustment screw and make sure that it has not been... Somebody may have adjusted it incorrectly. I believe on that one it should be out two and a quarter turns and uh, see if that straightens it out. Maybe bring it out to two and a half and see what it does. If not, you're going to have to open it up and take a look at the, uh, the idler jet itself. Yeah, 
Do you like us ask me, are they uh, the old style valves or the newer ones that have to be shimmed? I believe your machine was a 2015. Uh, I think you can do it on the fly. You shouldn't, uh, they're not shimmed. So you should be able to adjust them uh, on the machine itself. Well, y'all are in a weird mood, some weird moods today. <laughs> oh boy, an older one here. Uh, Matt's asking me, I have an 86200X. I haven't heard about that machine in a while. I've seen a video that they had an electric starter one. Would it be worth it? That would take a pretty good amount of effort to do because you're not just finding a place to get the starter on there. You have to address the electrical and the battery and the wiring getting down to it. With an 86, especially if she is pristine, I think I'd leave it alone and uh, just enjoy the ride. But that's just me. Jason's asked me, hey, John, is it worth changing from hydraulic brakes to brake caliper and pads? I'm, I'm not sure what you're asking me there. Or you're talking about going from a shoe type setup to a brake caliper and a, a disc? Hmm. If that's the question that you're actually uh, asking me, well, depending on your application, yes, it's going to outperform it every single time. And when I say it, I'm talking about the standard. You've got calipers and then the brake disc itself and then the pads where it's just squeezing the disc on either side. I mean, that's what all the performance machines have. Uh, that's pretty much the, uh, the standard. Uh, the only uh, machines that still use the, uh, the old type drum setup is typically on a uh, utility type machine. And it wouldn't hurt. It wouldn't hurt one of those to be uh, upgraded a little bit, in my opinion. Uh, scan down a little bit more. Jason Jones, yes, you are weird. Uh, certifiable. <laughs> Went to high school with him. <laughs> Get to work, Jason. Good grief. Somebody's package needs to be delivered. <laughs> Brian's asking me, I have a 2005 GSXR 1000. I need the size of the old trim plug and the socket size. Thanks. Well, Brian, I don't know off the top of my head, but I'm betting my little minions that are located down in Florida <laughs> could look up that information and probably get an answer before we sign off here in a few minutes. So. My Florida guys, can you look up that information for Brian and, uh, and post it on the, uh, on, the, on the chat for him? And I believe he uh, came in on the YouTube channel. Trey William is asking me, I have a 2003 Kawasaki Prairie 650 I just bought. Ran fine at first, but now I can't get it to crank. It turns over, so I took the small hose off under the carburetor and tried to crank it to see if fuel comes out and nothing. Bad fuel pump, fuel, fuse. Well, she's definitely not getting um, fuel at all, so that would be where I'd start off. I mean, you need to, the tank's back here, the carburetor's up here. It's got to get from one place to another. So start going through the electrical first, and then, well, I, I take that back. Make sure it's not stopped up anywhere to begin with. Make sure there's not crud down in the bottom of the tank that's not even releasing it down to the pump itself. Then check your pump, then check the lines going up front. If all that seems to be operating correctly, then it's time to take a look at the pump and see if it's actually doing what it's supposed to do. So it's, it's basically a divide and conquer. You just start pulling apart one system at a time until you can drill down and find the solution to what's causing the issue. Jason said, yeah, that's what I'm asking the old foreman. Uh, I, has, I have has drum brakes. An older foreman, it's, it probably wouldn't be worth to, worth it uh, to upgrade to uh, a standard set of calipers and disc, because a foreman that, that is the quintessential you know utility type machine, and to upgrade it with all the hydraulics uh, that would be a lot of work, um, and I don't think you really get the benefit out of it. But hey. If you feel like doing some welding and getting the brackets in place and the hoses in place, you know, have at it. But me, I, I'd probably, uh, I think I'd just spend the weekends enjoying it instead of uh, trying to upgrade it to do something it was never intended to do. All right, and Brian, they got your answer on the, uh, the plug, and that should be 17 millimeter. Thanks, guys. 
<laughs> All right, Williams asked me, okay, does the Raptor charge the battery because I don't want to get stuck with a flat battery? Well, yes, I mean, it's got a battery charging system, but it sh and I think you were the one that asked me earlier about going with the, uh, the LED lights and the correct way to do that. It should have enough oomph to deal with that. Now, the older type incandescent, not incandescent, just bulb type lights, yeah, that may be, that would have been much for, uh, a little bit too much for it. But with the LED technology, the current draw is so minimal, it, it should be able to deal with that fairly simply. All right, getting greetings from, uh, cordial greetings from Honduras. I have a player Sportsman 550 and your videos have helped me very, have been very helpful to me in my workshop at home. Well, you are welcome, thank you. That's one of, one of the reasons we do this uh, and I enjoy doing it. All right, Trey has asked me, sorry, one more thing, the fuel pump doesn't prime. Well, there you go, check your electrical going to it and then maybe time to replace that fuel pump. But I, I, I do want to caution you, go ahead and make sure that it's not gummed up. I've actually seen pumps that look like they were just in a ball of caramel syrup. I've actually cleaned them up, flushed them out, and they started working again. Now, don't count on that. It may be simpler just to replace it, but it sounds like you need to get that, uh, that pump out and take a look at it. All right, guys, we'll do one more. Trey, well, you're asking me another question. If the fuel pump doesn't prime on my prey, would that mean a bad fuse or pump? That's where you're going to have to get out the voltometer meter and or the test light and uh, see if she's getting power or not. All right, Brian, have one more question. What's the torque of the specs on that? Garrett, I bet you can answer that just off the top of your head. For a Gixxer uh, 1000, for a 17 millimeter old drain, it is 18 foot pounds. Or 18.5, something like that. Suzuki's are 18 to 18 and a half. All right, guys, that was Garrett Sifford. He also does a bunch of videos with me, and he is the oil change machine over there. If you need to know the specs, he's the man. Boy, was that, that, was that perfect for you or not? <laughs> All right, guys, well, guess what? There goes 30 minutes. Well, listen, we just want to say thank you for coming here and spending a little bit of time with us on this Friday afternoon, and especially shopping here with us at Partzilla. It makes all of this possible and uh, allows us to do what we do here. Well, once again, you have a great weekend. Have a great week. If I did not get to your question or if you want to add in another question later, we do go back and we look at the comment stream and we may lead off with whatever question was not answered or anything new at the beginning of the next week's session. So once again, just want to say thanks for dropping by, and we will see you next week, God willing. Y'all have a great weekend.